Hello, everybody. Hope everyone's well. Thanks for coming along. Um, today we've got a bit on, uh, if all the presenters turn up, that is, so fingers crossed on that one. <laughs> we have two. We have myself, um, Paul, who will jump in a little bit later. He's just had to – we actually got our days muddled up. We thought it was Wednesday because it was originally Wednesday and it got moved to Thursday due to a Microsoft Room booking issue. Then COVID version two happened and we didn't need the room, but we ended up on Thursday. So we got muddled up. So um, I'm theoretically supposed to be babysitting the kids right now, so they could break in at any moment. So uh, I think we're all used to that now, so we should be fine. Um, and Paul's going to join us at about 3.30. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to kick off first, just in case I have kid issues. Um, and we've got Chris and Josh from Jabra taking us through the Panacast. Anup from Ribbon, um, he's just jumped in now, you got him, yep, um, and Shane, uh, who's going to be taking us through, what are you taking us through actually? Doesn't, I, <laughs> that is a good question, no, oh, no, 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 sorry, 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 it's on the next slide, yeah. <laughs> Paul, Paul did the first two slides, so I, I didn't have it front of mind, <laughs> um, so we've kind of got it in this order, but um, if everyone doesn't mind, we might bump Shane up to straight after me because he's got kids to pick up from school. I don't know if uh, anyone else has any time constraints who are on that list. Chris, Josh? No, no, up. you go for it. It's all good. Any, any issues there? No, 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 no. We're, all good. we're all good. Awesome, awesome. So we've, we've got a bit to get through. Um, I probably won't take the full half an hour, but I just allowed 30 minutes just in case because uh, we go off on tangents sometimes. So... Um, I'm just going to take you through some of the cool things I think um, are, are good. There's about 10 or 12 of them that are either coming or, or have come or coming soon. So first one is this new pre-join experience. Uh, I think it's in the middle of rolling out. Um, I haven't seen it in my tenant as yet, but it's basically splitting off the audio options, which is a good thing. It's making it a bit clearer as to how you can join whether it be via your computer audio, phone audio, or, or a room as well. If you're in a room and proximity detection has detected that, um, it'll make it easy for you to join into your room, or no audio at all. Um, and the video option is in the same place, but we now have background filters uh, there as well, and they will actually be persistent going forward. And I think actually they are persistent as of today. Uh, it's this, this particular UI is not required for that persistency, but um, just pointing that out as well. Um, so every time you start a meeting, you will get that same background you chose. In the previous interface, we had to join with video, and then after we'd joined, we had to get and go and change it, which, which is a bit fiddly. So that's a nice new addition. Uh, next, Paul called this out last time. I just want to make sure everyone's using this new interface because it's probably the best thing Teams has released since its inception. Uh, but you do have to turn it on, so you need to go into your settings and actually turn that on because it's kind of a preview experience. But with that, once you get that pop-out view, you get the additional um, participant view, plus you can get the full 7x7 seven seven and that new together mode as well. Uh, so do turn that on if you haven't tried it. Next one that's coming soon in the next few months is this presenter spotlight. So right now, you can lock someone as uh, a, an individual spotlight for your own view. This will allow you to push that to all participants. So it's good if you're a lecturer or, or doing a presentation like this where I want, might want to force you guys to, to only look at me. Um, that would be very unfortunate, but you, you know, there's lots of use cases where that would be a good thing. Um, so yeah, all attendees in that view will see the feed. Uh, my next one is this meeting roster enhancements. So this is quite uh, often asked for where people want to understand who's come and gone in a meeting. This is probably a really good example uh, where we might want to understand who joined the meeting and how many people and when did they join, that sort of thing. Uh, right now, you can actually download that during the meeting from the meeting roster, but once you've finished the meeting, you lose access to that file, basically. Um, going forward, coming soon, we'll actually be able to get that attendance report posted to the meeting chat, and it will also be included with the meeting recording or and any transcriptions if you've also had that turned on uh, during that meeting. Um, so that's another nice enhancement. Oh, what have I done here? I jump, no. We've also got better notification settings coming. So this is a really good thing because you can see on the left-hand side there, uh, it's pretty overwhelming and can be a little bit confusing as to what does what. Uh, in this new interface, you've, you've got some pre-selects, which is really good. So for example, um, I would use 
mentions and replies if it was me that's pretty much how i've got it configured now uh, maybe with a few little custom settings added in uh, but that's typically what i'd use so users going forward can just literally go and press that button for for that to set their optimal choice and another one that's useful as well i think is just having more clear access to being able to turn the email notifications off because for me i find them kind of pointless they kind of just clutter your inbox you're already dealing with the notification in teams and then to get another one in the email is a little bit annoying although if you have noticed and i don't have it on this uh presentation but you can actually reply to teams messages in line within the uh message body in outlook um so you can actually hit reply i think it's only in outlook in the web at the moment as far as where i've seen it but yeah if you're in outlook for the web you can actually reply in line to the message without leaving that um outlook uh, message basically so it's, that's quite cool um Next is lists and a list app in Teams. I've actually started using this. In reality, it's actually just SharePoint lists and it looks a little bit fancier. And in actual fact, it only looks a little bit fancier because we have um, basically templated lists that you can create that give you a baseline and then Microsoft pretty much uh, creates that list for you as a based off that template and makes it a little bit more colorful and that sort of thing. You can actually do that yourself, but you need to know kind of a scripting language to, to make that happen. So it's actually quite hard to edit it and, make, and sort of customize it to suit you unless you understand how that works. So that's a little bit of a downside, but hopefully in the future, they'll make it a bit more user friendly to kind of build your own lists. Um, because if you've seen the SharePoint um, list editor, it's kind of probably confusing for most users, I would say. Not super user friendly, but um, I, I guess this will only get better. Um, and we've been using it ever since it um, ever, ever since it got uh, released, really. Um, and, and, and it is good, but it's really just honestly a list. We could have been using lists all along. It's just maybe made it sexy again. I'm not sure. Next one is the sharing links. I reckon this is really cool. I've had this show up uh, in my team. So when when you share a file now, uh, at, like from uh, OneDrive or SharePoint, for example. It actually does some checks as to whether the recipients have access to that file and it will let you then edit the permissions to make sure that they do write in line so you can do that in the um, teams interface which you can see above there and it's got that little video showing you how it looks you, you drop that um, link in there and it lets you edit who has permissions to it if people don't uh, and in outlook same thing happens i can paste a link in there it's recognized as a document for example and it will actually tell me that the person I've added in the um, to field doesn't actually have permission. So I can edit and fix that kind of straight in line. Uh, next is sharing links. So I'm sure we've all been in situations where we've had to move files around, um, probably files begin their life in OneDrive and then maybe move into a team and then move into a different site collection in SharePoint somewhere else. This basically uh, allows you to reshare any file that you move you can see if you can see my mouse here you've got this little tick box here to keep sharing with the same people um, so what will happen in that instance is that the file will, file will move the permissions will, will basically follow that document and people who are collaborators on that document already uh, will basically get an email to tell them that the file has moved and here's the new location for it so that's really really handy Whoops. Here we go. Uh, another SharePoint one is this automatic expiry of documents shared with guests. So you can set a threshold in the admin center as to how long should a shared document with a guest be accessible. And then after that time, the um, the file will no longer be accessible to that person. I don't think there's any sharer uh, controls to tell them it's about to expire. There's definitely admin controls. Um, so the admin will get warned that that's about to happen. Um, hopefully the user will also get that warning in the future if they don't already. Um, but if that does expire, then you you have to reshare those documents. So useful piece of security, I think. Um, we often have project sites that just um, end up sticking around forever and, and maybe you want an expiry of, you know, even if it was 12 months, just to, to kill it at some point without needing um, user inter intervention. Another one I like here is this OneDrive shortcuts because quite often you get shared something and then later down the track you can't remember where the email is that shared it to you and you forget 
where to go and find the document. And this, this basically allows you to add a shortcut to your own OneDrive. And so when you add that shortcut, it, ha it works for folders only. So if you get shared a folder, um, you can pin that folder effectively to the root of your OneDrive, your own OneDrive, so that when you go looking for it, it's kind of just, it appears as a folder within your own OneDrive, but actually in effect, it's a, um, it's a, it's a shared folder from someone else's tenant. That's quite useful. Uh, this one I think is really cool because if you're invested in the Microsoft ecosystem, your users are probably living mostly in Microsoft apps um, and search is getting better and better across them and it's exposing more and more stuff. Um, you know, for example, a SharePoint can look down into, into Teams, uh, into OneDrive uh, from that single search bar and this extends it further bringing in Power BI reports so those can be surfaced. And also you'll now be able to kind of write your own third party plugins or or there's an I think there's an app store for this actually as well. So um, again, just brings in all your searchability into this single platform, um, whether it be Office 365 data or maybe a third party system that you're stuck with and, and you know, Office 365 doesn't have an equivalent. Uh, there's lots of line of business apps along those lines. Um, don't know how excited people will be about receiving another email, but um, I thought this was kind of interesting. Depending on how intelligent it really is, it says using Microsoft intelligence, um, but basically it will do per user curation of articles from SharePoint that haven't been seen or read by that user that the intelligence thinks you might like to see. So that'll be an interesting one to see in practice if you're using SharePoint as your intranet and you're actively updating it with, with news articles and announcements and all that sort of stuff. Uh, whether in practice, you know, this kind of will drive people to actually read the content that you're posting. Uh, this is not that new, I don't think, um, but I had the first chance to have a bit of a play with it just um, a week or so ago, and I thought I would include it anyway. It's, it's reasonably new. Um, but basically, this lets you sync uh, message center messages to to a planner, uh, which I think is quite good because, I mean, we're actively using planner all the time and mostly within Teams, and this allows me to basically have a planner uh, tab open with my message center um, tasks that I need to take care of, and you can automatically sync those into that planner. And so you can see in this example here, uh, to the left of this, you can't see, but I've got uh, another container or bucket, as they're called, that brings in the synced messages and all of them get dropped into there. And then I basically just sort of sift through them and order them into the, the category. Um, and then I mark them with whether I should be planning for that change within the user base or whether it's just an informational one. And for our business, we don't really care about it, but it's interesting. Uh, or you know whether I've actioned it or, or that sort of thing. So it's it's a nice, I think, easy place to go and manage that where you're already working rather than having to log into the message center. Um, and potentially, I guess, I, I don't know how you drop this down to the user level, but I guess you can give access to you know your change managers and things like that so they can have easy access to it. Um, and also the added ability of, of Planner over the message center is being able to kind of manage resources to actually action things that need to happen. So that's quite a useful one that I'm going to use a lot. Uh, if you haven't caught on, IE11 support in Teams initially will be dropping off November 30. Hopefully people aren't really using IE anymore. It's, I think it's near dead already, but I'm sure some people out there are, uh, probably for certain line of business apps. Um, so for Teams, Teams Web will no longer support it after November 30, and Office 365 overall, so all apps and services, will be August 2021. Now that doesn't mean Internet Explorer is no longer supported. That will still follow the life cycle policy for um, the operating system that it was shipped with, basically. So Internet Explorer is not kind of dead completely, but Office 365 services are, are basically end of lifing it. Uh, and if you don't know, the new Edge browser, which is based on Chromium, so very, very similar to, to Chrome, um, but it's almost identical, uh, that actually has a IE uh, mode. So I haven't actually played with it myself, but I'm I assuming I'm assuming it, it will render things the way IE11 would. I don't know if it incorporates um, you know, the different additional security and things like that that IE has always had over and above a lot of other browsers. Not sure, um, but that's something to look at if you needed that IE support and maybe it would work for your 
line of business apps if you if you had one or two of them right um okay and our oh, edge legacy so that's the original edge that's microsoft's attempt at a new browser which was edge and then they decided actually we'll use chromium because um you know, it's a good edge and it's proven most of the people on the internet are using chrome so they've just taken a, a a fork i suppose of chrome and badged it ie um, and i'm actually using that myself and it, it's pretty good and you're starting to see some of the microsoft specific things getting incorporated into it for example it recognizes opening a sharepoint document as an example whereas chrome always struggled with that um the each browser will know how to handle a, an, an office 365 document and open it directly in the application so that's quite quite handy um, and that is me so i had here that we have jabra but let's um let's let shane jump into it do you want to share your screen directly was there any questions for me actually before we move on while shane's getting getting all set up cool there he is hey My mic, mic is muted. Uh, yeah, I don't get things well. <laughs> I'm not very good at uh, making sure that I've uh, got the mic off mute, but I've shared the screen. We all have that problem, mate. We all have it. <laughs> yeah. Good screen. Okay, so a bit about me. My name's Shane Hoey. Uh, so I'm across here in Australia uh, from Brisbane. Uh, that kind of looks like me, that photo. I look a little bit greyer now. We, uh, a couple, about six months ago, we fostered um, a mother dog and 12 pups. I guarantee you will hear in the next hour, I've, I've fed them. You'll probably hear screaming and that, it'll be the puppies. Uh, they're about eight weeks old now, I think. So um, it's, it's been a long eight weeks. It feels like eight months. So, so I do apologize if you hear barking, if you hear snoring, or if you hear fighting in the background. Uh, but yeah, my name's Shane. Uh, I'm from Audio Codes MVP. Uh, I've been Microsoft MVP now for about 10 years, mainly around the PowerShell and the automation and administration. So around that uh, traditional IT pro spot. Uh, as I mentioned, I don't do, I uh, work for Audio Codes, but today this session's not about Audio Codes. There's nothing really Audio Codes-ish in it. Um, it's all about what I do and how I administer teams. Um, so some of this stuff I've put, I've got on my website. It's kind of bad at the moment. Um, I'm not one for writing documentation. I hate repetitive work. So this is a little bit about me. I hate anything repetitive. If I have to do something once, twice, three times, absolutely hate it. I hate writing documentation and I'm, I'm sure everyone is, this, in, in this session is probably similar. You know, you're writing lots of documentation. Not a marketing person, as you can tell. Um, I love doing the technical work. So I'm in my happy place where I'm uh, like, for example, at the moment for the next three months, I'm on a project. I'm getting really digging deep into SBCs with uh, local media optimization and doing all that planning. And th that's my happy place. I didn't turn my video on anyway. Uh, there we go, that's better. Um, and yeah, so that's my happy place is doing technical work. The other thing, I hate being tied to a physical workplace. I can't remember for pro oh, well, probably 10 years plus, I've been working from home um, and, and really living what we all think is normal. Other people today are just getting used to, you know, using Teams and the like. Okay, so that's the neg negatives, but this is the thing. So repetition, anything we're doing is an excuse to automate. Okay, so whether it's through Logic Caps, Docker, Flow, PowerShell, Graph API, and Teams is no, no um, Teams, we can automate Teams through all of that. Today, I'm going to show you a bit on some of the automation that they put into the Teams Admin Center as well as PowerShell. 
Um, but really don't forget about things like Graph API. There's plenty of examples out there. Teams is very highly extensible. Uh, you can do flow, or I should say power automate. I still prefer calling it flow. Uh, power automate, logic apps, those type of things. Very easier as a citizen developer. So someone without a developer background to do the automation. Documentation, as I said, I don't like it. Documentation, once again, it's re repetitive. I made a conscientious effort about six months ago to say goodbye to Microsoft Word. And since then, I very rarely write any documentation in Word. I use JSON, I'm using Markdown. If you're not used, I'll give you an example of this Markdown. Using Visual Studio Code, and there's a great little word processor called Zetla, which I'll show you. Basically, you write everything in Markdown. You can then convert to PDF, you can convert to Word and the like. And that's gonna that's a really big save timer. You can tie this together because you can use PowerShell to grab all the information. So for example, your SBCs, you can put it into uh, a Word, uh, sorry, into a Markdown document, convert it to Word and send it off to the customers really quickly, getting the documentation done. As I mentioned, marketing is not a dirty, uh, sorry, marketing is not a dirty word. I am a technical expert for and foremost, and that's what I strive to be. Um, but I also do do a lot of marketing in terms of, you know, getting on, doing presentations and the like, but technical is my main thing. And I like to think of myself as a modern employee. Uh, you know, I work from coffee shops, okay, airports, I need to update the slides. Kids sports, it's uh, my kids play a lot of sport during the week and, um, you know, I'm quite often on calls on the mobile, um, rarely in the office, uh, working a lot from the home office. So, you know, I'm really living the teams and using teams to its fullest. Um, and I think as we try and sell teams, we need to be also using teams the most. The agenda going to do mainly demos and, and questions. So if you have demos, any questions, if, um, you know, open open up the session, um, ask questions. Main thing is I'm gonna go look at the Teams Admin Center, uh, some of the group policy objects. Now, I only noticed this in the last couple of weeks, um, so I'm not sure exactly when it came in, but it makes administration not so much easier, uh, especially when we're talking in the direct routing. Uh, so obviously from audio codes, uh, doing a lot of SBCs and the like, I focus very much on the voice components. Uh, also look at PowerShell, so you may not be aware, you no longer need the Skype for Business um, PowerShell module. Uh, so I haven't used it now for a couple of, couple of months. Uh, you can do everything you were doing inside the Teams module. There is a caveat there you need to use the preview module, which I'll show you that as well. And um, because you can use a team module, if you are prefer to use Linux, you can use Linux. That now opens up using things like, for example, Docker. And I'm gonna give you a quick example of how I manage uh, with Docker. And if we get time, I'd like to give a little documentation primer. Two guarantees. I'll get sidetracked during the session, and I generally run over time when I do this. In today, I don't think I will. I've only really set up two or three demos. Um, but yeah, whoops. All right, so when we're talking about administering, my, my thing about it is always use the right tool for the job. In some instances, our GUI can be better than PowerShell. As a PowerShell person, you know, I'm always going to be saying PowerShell is the best. Um, However, if I'm trying to get a customer to who's never used PowerShell before to uh, publish a sorry publish a uh, PSTN gateway or create voice routing, I'm going to ask them to open up the Teams Admin Center, and I'm going to talk them through that way. I'm not going to ask them to do it via PowerShell because you know there's there's the right tool for the job. If I have to make a simple change to a user user account, and I can know that I can do that quickly in the GUI once again. I'm probably going to do that rather than PowerShell. One of the things I highly recommend, Visual Studio Code. So if you haven't transitioned to Visual Studio Code yet from the older ISE, definitely look at uh, look at that sooner rather than later. Uh, 
Along with that is Docker, GitHub. So if anything that you're sharing today, putting, uh, so anything that I share, I normally have in GitHub. Um, it's a learn, it's a bit of a steep learning curve, GitHub in that as an IT pro, I wasn't ready for the whole branches and um, the whole way GitHub works, but for storing scripts and everything, it's really, it's a really good way. I also store a lot of documentation on GitHub under private repos because you can do a lot of tracking. And because as I said, I gave up Word, I'm doing everything in text files now. I can save them into GitHub. I can have version control and the like. Git, of course, is a part of uh, where that version control. And there's a really cool app called Zetla. So it's a documentation application um, because, you know, I hate doing doco, but the big thing that we have to do as consultants is documentation and too rightly so. And we shouldn't be making sure our documentation is always up to date. And Zetla is an awesome application. Since I started doing it, I found I've saved so much time. Flow, Power Apps, get involved in that. Um, and also the last one, just understand the difference between Windows PowerShell and PowerShell Core. So Microsoft have got Windows PowerShell, which is what comes shipped with Windows. And then there's PowerShell Core, which we can run on Mac, uh, run on Linux and so forth. I'm going to give a quick demo today of creating a PSDN gateway inside Linux. OK, let's jump to the demos. And any questions during the time, just just jump in and away we go. Oops, sorry, wrong browser window. Doesn't matter how many times I practice this, I always get the wrong browsers. So in Teams, there's a new, well, I think it's new. I'm not sure if you, you've seen it or not. Uh, group policy assignments, and this is pretty cool. Most policies now today have group policy assignments. Works very similar to the licensing. Uh, so as you're probably aware in licensing, we can set up uh, on any group. So if we've got a group, so for example, if I look at my engineering group, I can set up licenses and I can apply all my licenses via Active Directory. So as we have new employees onboarding, we just have to put them into a group and we're licensing that user straight away. They've brought in now Teams policies and it's in most locations. It's not on all the lo on everything yet. Uh, for example, if we look at the standard Teams policies, so by default we would have a uh, private, sorry, by default we have our global policy. What I've done is I've created one called pi private channels and or it's a custom policy. I'm turning on uh, private channels. By default, it may have been turned off. Um, so let's say, for example, if private channels was turned off, apply. Um, so the by default, we've got private channels turned off. Now I want to apply that to just the management. And there's my dog in the background. <laughs> I did try to get him to sleep. <laughs> so what we can do is uh, group policy assignments. And so group policy assignments basically is just an active, uh, sorry, an Azure AD group that we're going to assign. And if you have a look, we can choose a group, SG dash, so I'll choose, uh, for example, the IT group, and I can assign them the specific policy. So anyone in, and in this example, anyone in the SG executive, SG HR and SG IT will be assigned that private channels policy. So you can have multiple policies and uh, you can also adjust the rank as well. This is in quite a number of locations. If we look at uh, voice, so if we come down to our, uh, sorry, our call park policy. So once again, you can see we can um, create group policy assignments in there as well. If uh, same for the calling policies. So for example, if we wanted to create um, allow calling policy, apply that, we can um, come in here and we can create our policy. 
One of the ones that I really like about the call, uh, calling policy is the, let me just bring this one up. Uh, sorry, yeah, not the calling policy, the meetings policy. So under our meetings policy, there's a new option. You may or may not have seen it. I only saw this one yesterday. Um, so you can see here, I've created a policy for the executive and sales and marketing. So sales and marketing, as an example, they do a lot of recordings and there's a thing called NDI. NDI is um, broadcasting, so doing allow video. And um, you'll see on the screen what it allows us to do is route to another, so OBS, open broadcast. So we have an OBS. Um, so if you're doing podcastings, recording, you can choose a video stream and you record it in something other than just Teams. Uh, and you can do look at the primary speaker, the local individual users and so on. Obviously, we don't want to enable NDI for all our users. So as a real world example, if we jump into the admin, whoops, jump into our admin center, I'll create a sales and marketing policy. I'll come down to, it's in here, here, here we go, allow NDI. So by default, NDI streaming is turned off. Um, but I've turned it on for anyone in sales and marketing. What will happen when people log in, they'll get an extra, some extra couple of options and uh, then they can select teams like they would select a video camera in something like, for example, OBS. To apply that policy, we come to our group policy assignments and once again, we just create a group, we rank the group. so. Um, depending on the rank. So we could have some users could be ranked as not enabled, other users could be en enabled and there's a hierarchical portion to it. Uh, whoops, sorry, I hit the wrong. <laughs> it's not coming up. <laughs> What's going on? Okay, I'm just going to add a new group. So, so it's very similar here. We just put in our group uh, SG dash sales and marketing. And we assign sales and marketing people to the group. So in this example, NDI is turned off for the executive, but it's turned on. Uh, they've got some extra features on there, some other different policies. So if you're in both the executive and the sales and marketing group, it's going to be applied as per the rank in, in order. Uh, Dol, one of the big ones in direct routing, this is quite old. You'll, you'll be, uh, so most of you will be aware now, SBCs and uh, we can all do that now all within the, within the portal. So we can add in our SBCs we can do all our location based routing and media optimization settings and the like. If you're just doing where I like to use this is like I said, when I'm talking of one or two SBCs, people don't necessarily have that PowerShell uh, background. It's a lot easier to come in here and say, just type in now FQDN and, and, and the like. Some other cool stuff that I've seen uh, recently, the main, Obviously, there was some changes earlier on around the network planning and, and the like for me, but it's really is the policies and the group policy assignment. You can really automate things. Your management of teams comes down uh, to basically Active Directory groups. Uh, and now let's just quickly, because I think I'm doing all right for time, let's jump across to one of my favorites. And this is Docker. So if you, if you don't know what Docker is, um, Docker desktop basically allows us to run, uh, I wouldn't call them uh, containers. You can run Docker desktop obviously on your PC. You, you can run containers up in Azure. Uh, you can run containers on Docker, I believe as well. Um, so there's, there's a whole lot of areas you can run your containers. One of the things I like to do when I'm doing my management is use a Docker container. 
So I'm in Visual Studio here, and uh, I've got no containers, just make sure, cool. What, what I like to do is use Docker, because if we look at my um, machine, and if I type in get dash module list available, so just looking at all the modules I've got open, When it comes up. Okay. Can you see that screen all right? It's not too small, is it? No, no that's, that's good, mate. mate. Yeah, cool. Okay, so what we're going to do is just to show you, I definitely don't have Teams installed. I definitely don't have Skype installed. Now, PowerShell Gallery, if we look at PowerShell Gallery and Microsoft Teams, I do have it open on one of these. Okay, so there's a couple different versions. So version 1.14, the current release, and we have version 1.13 preview and 1.15 preview. Today, I'm going to demo 1.13 preview. There's a really important command in 1.3 preview. If we look at the commands, we will find there is, let me just find it, control F, new dash CS online session. Okay, if you're running the production version, so of Microsoft Teams 1.14, you won't be seeing new CS online session. So what that does, of course, is allows us to do all the Skype for Business commands inside our Microsoft Teams. Skype for Business required Windows PowerShell. Microsoft Teams can be run on PowerShell Core, which means Teams module can be run on Linux, it can be run on Mac, and of course, Windows as well. By, have, by using the new CS Online session, we're effectively doing what we were doing in the Skype for Business, but we're able to do it inside PowerShell Core. So if we jump back to our little quick demo. So one of the things I don't like doing is I often run different versions of Windows PowerShell. You have different modules and the like. So sometimes, I'll be dealing with customers where they won't necessarily want me running a preview version of the Teams module, um, or they might want me to run, you know, specific versions of specific modules, the Azure commandlets, there's, there's always those things. So I like to keep my machine clean and I use Docker. So what you can do with Docker is you can create a Docker file. And all this is, as you can see, I'm saying from, my, get, grabbing the latest version of PowerShell from Microsoft, a couple little ma labels, I'm putting my, like my name, my main, the date that I've done it, and then I'm running some PowerShell commands. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm installing the Microsoft Teams. You can see I've got the required version, 1.13 1, preview. If I wanted to update that, I, I just have to go 1.15. Installing the Azure, installing uh, because Obviously, I do a lot of work with media and gateways, so I'm installing media modules, IP phone modules. I have my own little profile. I'm creating my environment and I set an entry point. What that uh, then allows me to do is if I can right click, I can build that image and I've got two places to build that image, either in Azure or on my local machine. I normally, what I do is I also use GitHub. So by using GitHub, and I won't have time to show this, but I basically publish up to GitHub, then Docker will come, will automatically build that image for me. So if I submit this now, and I won't submit it now because it'll be 10 minutes before I could do my demos, what would happen if I was to push this up onto GitHub, Docker would rebuild that Linux machine for me, automatically install the Microsoft Teams, the Azure, the Medium, the IP phones, 
copy my profiles. I've also got another version which I also copy a lot of scripts in. Um, so any scripts that I use on a regular basis, it copies it in. And what it, so what we then can do is, oops, go back to the demo. Anytime I want to run a container, I can just say docker pull and then the name. In this case, it's Shane Hoey slash Teams tools. And it's going up to Docker, grabbing that latest version. And uh, if you go to, so you can see here, this is where I've got it stored on GitHub. This is public. And then on Git, on Docker Hub, I've got the same thing up there on Docker Hub. Uh, and you can see, so anyone could, could run this. OK, so it's grabbed it. What I'm doing now is I'm just saying Docker run and IT for interactive, and I'm going to run that container. And you can now see I'm in a PowerShell session. And if I was to say get dash module, uh, so if we do a get, get module, uh, copy, I'll see. Listing available modules, you'll see that I've got Microsoft Teams and Azure there. The other thing is I am on a Windows box, as you can see, but because I'm running it inside Docker, if I look at the version, you'll see that it's actually running inside Linux. You can, uh, as I mentioned, this demo will only work with the two preview modules. In my case, um, I'm running the Whoops. Copy. So in the, my case, I'm running version 1.13, but this would work with 1.15 as well. I still don't have Skype. OK, so if we tried to look for the Skype module, I'm not using the Skype. I am actually using the Teams module. OK, so if I look for stop, you can see that there is none. All right, let's get into the nitty gritty. First things, we're going to connect to Microsoft Teams. OK, it's going to prompt me to authenticate. I use this a lot now when I'm doing, uh, a lot of the times I'll be doing large deployments. Um, so for example, I'm doing one at the moment, it's across about 30 countries where the customer says, we don't want you going in, doing everything, but they want to restrict when I can and cannot have access. So I'm like, that's fine. They, what they do is they just open up a browser window. They log on for, for me. So for example, they go to, um, you can't, they'll, I'll give them the code and then they'll log on. If I wasn't already logged on, this would prompt I, there we go. It is going to prompt me for a username and password. So that can be the other side of the world. If we come back to PowerShell. You can see we're logging in. And uh, we're now logged in to Microsoft Teams. And as I mentioned, if we look at all these CS commands or, or the old Skype for Business commands, there, there is the new CS Online session. And like we used to do, we just run our session so into a variable, and you can see that's now logging me onto Skype for Business. This does take a bit of time, so hopefully I'm not taking up too much time. And then we can just import that session into our current PowerShell session. So that's no different than we were managing Skype for Business today. And this, this takes a little bit of time. But the important thing, what I love about this is that I now no longer have to have any Skype for Business PowerShell or anything installed on my machine. If we look at Docker, so here's Docker on the left-hand side, and I refresh that, you'll see that we've got a container running. Likewise, if I was to look at Docker Hub, oh, sorry, Docker Desktop, Oops, didn't come up. Wrong screen, sorry. Uh, 
Oh, it's not coming up. Where is it gone? Ah, uh, doesn't matter. Oh yeah, here it goes. Here it goes. You can see here I'm running Docker. Obviously, Docker Desktop is free. Um, I've got a container running, running PowerShell, running Skype for Business, uh, the modules, and I can do the Skype for Business modules. I'm running out of time because I'm, like I said, I guarantee I'll always go over. Um, one thing you can do is you can limit all the everything that you bring back, and that's my goal in the next updating my module, I'm going to set that so it automatically just brings back the commands we want. Because obviously when we're running this, all it's doing is doing a implicit remoting, so PowerShell implicit remoting. And uh, if we copy this, you'll see that we've got a uh, PowerShell session opened um, and it's open to this API interfaces records.teams.microsoft.com. So, um, so, got a delivery. Yeah. <laughs> Shane, is that they your... lasted well, they lasted well, two minutes yeah. early. I, I, I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, but you can see here, so we've got all the commands, there's 475 Skype for Business commands. I can do my commands like get, whoops. <laughs> Dash CS online. Uh, and then uh, let's get our PSTN gateway. Oops. Yes, I get dash CS online. Dogs are distracting me now. Did I did I tell you I get easily distracted? <laughs> There we go. And there's our online, like online CS PSD and gateway. Of course, I'm running all this in Linux and running a container on my laptop. If I had another customer now come up and said, hey, Shane, can you do this quickly? All I need to do is just create another. I can jump back up here. I can rerun this Docker container. And I've got all my scripts, everything that I want to run on it. And uh, whoops. Sorry, I can and I can come on here and I can run Docker again. And you can see I've got a second machine so I can make a third to another customer. And they are they are physical or not physically, but they are two virtual machines or two containers running. So you could have three, four of these containers running different customers that, during, you know, you could be working on one main customer. The other thing that I do often is I'll have a customer. So for example, I have a customer I'm working at the moment where I'm working all the time on that particular customer. On my desktop, I will have a container specifically for them. I'll be using start transcript. Every time I boot up, it's starting creating transcripts. So I've got a record of absolutely everything that I've done on their tenant um, with start transcript uh, with absolutely everything. And I know that that Docker container is specifically for administrating them. All right, finally, this one, I'm just going to show you. This is not Teams related, but this is one of my little favorite things. I did mention it and I, I'm going to speed up. <laughs> Uh, where did I put the demo? Okay, I just want to show you this little quick demo. Okay, I mentioned Markdown. Those of you not aware, Markdown, very simple. Uh, you just basically, here is a title. Um, you just type your text. So you can copy and paste and you can create tables and, and all that type of stuff. What we can do, there's a program called Zettler. And uh, so this is Zettler here. The cool thing about Zettler is um, you can type, you can very similar to words, got spell check, it's got all that type of stuff. But it, the good thing is when you're sharing across countries, especially when you've got uh, word templates, we've all been in that situation where the word template gets corrupted, you've got right to left, left to right, and all, all that type of stuff, you get different fonts, different. You, we've all been in that situation in here. We don't get that simple text file. You can edit it with Visual Studio Code. You can edit it with something like Zettler. There's some others, Typeria and, and a few others. Once we're finished doing our documentation, obviously we save this either on GitHub with versioning or, or even inside Teams. 
you can just create a Word document and, and there you go. You've got a Word document come up and you can give that to your customers. I do take it a little bit further where I will have, uh, so for example, uh, let me just bring up this example here. Uh, so what this one does is you can see I've got, I'm using Liquid. So Liquid is just uh, used by, it's it's like um like a like a templateless I can't think of it. A lot of websites use it. Shopify, Jekyll, and a few others. So I have a JSON file. Anywhere where I say title, it'll grab that. Anywhere I say author, um, you know how I can do page breaks. I can do custom styles. I have all these word styles and the like. Um, if I was to just come into our JSON file, whoops. I can, let me go across to Word, uh, to Visual Studio to show you. So I can have just a simple JSON file. As you can see here, I've just got some, you know, metadata, so that the template, but anywhere I put the author. So if I say uh, demo, version one as you can see the so in the the liquid itself uh it's just it's just a template what will happen in a few moments time i mean it's just automatically happens in the background our word document will open up and create now the way i'm doing that of course is with uh flow and Basically, Flow is just sending that, it sees that I've saved that document and then just sends it off to uh, a container, which then just converts the markdown to a Word document. And then, whoops, it's always easier when you're doing the run throughs, you don't get as many mistakes. Sorry about that. Try again, there we go. Okay, so there you go, and you can see that we're creating a documentation um, and, and we will have all different types of heading types and table styles, custom table styles for PowerShell and that type of stuff. That's all used, at, the ins and outs gets pretty complicated on how I do that. Um, I have a website, directoradding.guide, where that is how I do it. It's all done, logic apps, containers, uh, there's software called Pandoc. Um, Pandoc is really good, and that's how I do all the conversion from that markdown to Word. But if you are writing a lot of documentation, especially around Teams, direct routing, that type of stuff, really invest some time in that, you can you can save, some, save a lot of time. I think I'm way over time. <laughs> and, not too uh, bad, not too bad. Yeah. Five um, minutes over, we'll forgive you. Okay, I knew I was going to go over, but I really like <laughs> showing that demo because um, it's cool. It just makes life a lot easier. And we've all been there with Microsoft Word. Word, when you're doing, you know, multiple people editing documents, it gets difficult. Yeah, totally. I love automation as well. And um, you're a master compared to me. Um, and I've seen some of Shane's automatic document creation things that he's built that actually spit out entire as built documents and all sorts of crazy stuff. So that, that you can, there's amazing things what you can do with it. So hey, yeah. thanks Shane, appreciate that. That was no quite a fascinating session. It's very different to what we normally have um, at our user group. So and I've actually learned a few things as well. I've gone and added some policies like NDI and uh, I've downloaded that Zettler and done a few things as you've been speaking. So I'm gonna be interested to go and have a look at that. Yeah, definitely that NDI is a good, that is a really good one. I'm looking forward to playing around with that. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it looks really good. Cool. Awesome. Cool, All right. Would, yeah, thank you. Would the chaps from Jabra like to step up? I think you're next. Thanks, Shane. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Thanks for that, Shane. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Chris. I'm the National Partner Manager for Jabra, for those who don't know me. Um, I'm assuming you can hear my heads here, right? I'm, I'm mute, unmuted. Yeah. Yep. Thank God for that. That would have been a great start for a company <laughs> yeah, yeah. that works for an audio company. Um, so uh, today's um, 
presentation is just going to be um, on Jabra Panic House. I'm just going to bump that screen up and share that and do the old cliche. Can you see my screen? Which I'm sure you can. We can indeed. Cool, great. So I'll just kick straight into it. I appreciate um, Tom is of the essence. So uh, for those who aren't familiar with Jabra, we sit under a much larger company called Great Greater Nordic GN Group. And what's unique about GN is that we cover all grades of audio. So that being medical, professional and consumer. And medical, we're actually the world's largest manufacturer of hearing aids. So we've got GN Resound, which is a really familiar brand in the hearing aid. Um, vertical and then right down to consumer uh, so you'd be probably familiar with the Jabra 65T 75T earbuds some of our move um, uh, devices but then where I sit and where Josh sits who who's also on the call today we sit in the professional grade the CCNO which is actually our largest part of the Jabra brand um, and also Blue Parrot which is our industry strength headsets um, dust resistant massive noise cancellation but what we really wanted to talk to you today was about Panacast. Before we get on to that, um, I'll just introduce, I've, I've introduced myself, there's my details, um, and we can make this presentation available to everyone if they if they want to. I might give it to Paul or, or Andrew just to dispute, distribute afterwards. But Josh is also on the call today. He looks after the Panacast product for, um, for uh, I can hear the dogs again, for, um, for, Australia, for our ANZ. And uh, he is your go-to for the technical side. Um, any questions you might have on that, so please feel free to reach out to him as well. So you come to me for the demo gear, the uh, information, deployments, etc., and then Josh for, for all the technical stuff. So we're here to talk about Panacast. Panacast is um, our um, entry play into the into the the uh, AV market. About 18 months ago, we acquired a company, uh, Panacast, from a company called Altea Systems. And what's unique about Panacast is uh, that is a real-time immersive intelligent camera. And what I mean by that is I don't have one on me at the moment um, to show you, but what what they are is not much larger than a credit card, really. And this camera has three lenses, uh, three cameras, and what they do is they stitch in a real-time process at about 18 inches, um, and using an intelligent um, vision processor built into the camera, uh, it's using an algorithm based off weightage and facial recognition to stitch around people. And what you do is you get the seamless image of a 180-degree capture. And so it's really unique in the fact that it includes everyone in the conversation with real-time data being enabled. So you'll see this fundamental play of 100% video, audio, and data. So where it really sits and where its sweet spot is with the huddle room. So being a uh, Microsoft event, this is a uh, Microsoft Teams room and Microsoft Teams certified device. And it's really targeted at the huddle room, the small reading room space, which is a growing phenomenon. Now, I know that the world's changed a little bit at the moment, but the huddle room is still really popular and built and organizations or architectures now designing, um, redesigning buildings to incorporate smaller meeting rooms whilst trying to get more people into the room. So if we looked up, if we looked at it against a conventional camera in a small meeting room space, you potentially lose up to 40% of wasted space. You can exclude two to five people from the from the uh, from the image, and you can't detect the data. But with Panacast up against the wall, you actually get 100% video, audio, and data, and it's seamless. And here's another good example from a bird's eye view of a huddle room up against the conventional 120 degree camera. You can see that full capture, and um, and very little uh, and, and no wastage of space. So here's an actual real image instead of me kicking you a marketing one. A gentleman right in the middle here from, from Jabra in Copenhagen in our office. You can see here that that full field of that full clear field of field of view. Both the two um, individuals on each side are up against the wall. And up against the conventional camera, um, they're being cut out of the picture. But what else is also important to note is that you uh, can see a significant scale distortion. So that same algorithm that that uh, creates that 180 degree stitching and, and panoramic view also caters for scale distortion to give you a actual proportionate um, correction in, in how it looks. It's, it's, you see the bend at the top, it pushes it to the top and the bottom, and you get a seamless, real looking image. So it's really important at the moment with social distancing. So you can have a huddle space, you can have a small room, but still maintain that two meters distancing using that 180 degree capture. So it's actually becoming more prominent. This has been very successful in Australia and Josh can touch on that a little bit too. He's actually from Australia, um, but this is also becoming more and more prominent now in, in New Zealand, particularly Auckland as we step down from level three into that level 2.5. So you can imagine that this is gonna become more and more more and more important, maintaining those conferencing, those meetings whilst maintaining social distancing. 
but just a couple of features before I pass you off to Josh. Um, high dynamic range, you can just see here from the top image to the bottom, the high dynamic range feature does um, balance the, the contrast and exposure and gives you the optimal lighting in those brighter rooms. You know, for example, if you have a light over the top of your roof, uh, over the top of the meeting or a lot of sun shining in. Josh is actually on a Panacast today and he's in a room that is typically drenched with sunlight, Queensland sunlight. And you can see with high dynamic range how the white balance is a really, um, really uh, the exposure and it's really optimal for lighting. And you don't have to have 180 degrees view. It does have intelligent zoom. So what this means is um, out of the box of Microsoft Teams rooms, it's set to 180 degrees. But because it's a facial recognition device and it's because it's an intelligent camera, it does look for who's in the room and it will crop and um, adjust to who is participating. So you don't always have to have that 180 degree capture. You can uh, just have it for one individual, three individuals, etc. So that's me trying to cram a lot of information into a short amount of time. Um, like I said, I'll share this information um, and you can reach out to me at any point. We do have demo stock and we're going to talk about bundles very shortly too. But what I wanted to do is hand you over to Josh to talk about the advanced features and service capabilities and how it works really well with your Microsoft integration, your Teams environment. So over to you, Josh. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Hope you're all having a lovely day. So a quick one before we start. For those who haven't seen the Panacast, it's what I'm holding in my hand here. So it's incredibly tiny. So really, um, really nice and small and neat solution. Um, this is the actual insides of the camera. So it's actually how we we come up with the with the 180 degree um, field of view. So if you see here, we've got the the three cameras, um, and what we do to to give that 180 degree field of view that you can see in my um, in my video that I'm, I'm throwing up at the moment. We pop it on a cylindrical panorama, stitch it all together, and that's how it comes up with the 180 degree um, field of view. Um, the real power of the device, it's got eight processors sitting in that Panacast Vision processor. So the amount of data that we can pull out of the camera um, is really powerful. So um, what we what we can see with the, with the camera um, is that um, whilst you're also delivering um, video in a, in a Microsoft Teams room, or if you're doing it on, connected in a BYOD scenario, connected to Teams, and um, we can also pull out data um, from the camera as well. So with the real smart part of the camera is it's by integrating our SDKs and APIs. So all the, the software from Jabra, whether it's our headsets, speakerphones, um, and cameras are all, uh, all our software is free, whether our SDKs, APIs, our remote management software is all free. So the data that you can pull out of the camera is really powerful. So one of the really popular SDKs that you can pull out of our uh, out of the Panacast is a people count feature. So the ability to see how often your your meetings are being used, potentially setting alerts for COVID, um, the, in terms of how many people you want to set that limit um, in a room, or if you connect it to some some other other features you've got, if you connect it to some of the publicly available object libraries, you can actually see what's happening in the room. So you see in this, this is our old um, Cupertino office um, where LT Systems used to be. They've just moved into a shiny new office um, in the last couple of weeks. Um, but the ability to see what's happening in this room, so you see there's all those. Um, all those um, chairs in there, the monitors, the screens. So potentially you could do some asset tracking or you could, if you've got a, a portable, like potentially a surface hub in that room and you want to make sure it doesn't go anywhere, um, you can do asset tracking hiding in there as well. Um, but there's some more solutions with the camera whilst it's delivering video. You can also do people counting. So a scenario that we, we've seen is quite popular, actually popping it into a, a lecture theatre theater at a university and just counting the amount of people in there. And especially important now, with a COVID limit, if you've got 50% and potentially a solution by using the people count feature is to send an alert to the, the lecturer once you've you've overgone that threshold of um of 50% for that particular room as an example. Um, so the way we we um we kind of position the camera, it's fantastic for a for a meeting room to put in that small and medium meeting room to, um, to deliver great um video, but there's also a lot of data that you can pull out of the camera. So the way we kind of explain it, because you can see the whole room. Um, with a 180 degree field of view, you can actually capture all the data in terms of what's happening in that room. So where we kind of position it, because you can see the you see the people count by integrating our SDK, you can generate um, room analytics and and integrate in that services that you um, that you offer to your customers. Um, an example of that in the real world is actually the integration between um, the Joan booking room um, system um, and the Jabra Panacast. So Joan's an e ink booking room panel solution. Um, so what they've done, they've integrated the people count function of the and the SDK of the Panacast and connected it through their APIs. And what it does is when you actually walk in a room for an ad hoc um, meeting, it actually detects that you're actually sitting in the room, um, sends that people count function through to Joan and actually changes the booking room panel to booked and it'll update 365 to, to booked as well. Um, 
if you have an hour long meeting and you leave um, in at half an hour, um, it'll detect there's actually no one in the room, the camera, and it sends that information back through to Joan and actually um, releases the room and releases it in 365 as well. So it shows the kind of power that you can can get and the extra information that you can deliver by um, like using the, the, the data and the, the SDKs out of the camera as well. Um, from a compatibility to, and integration perspective, so if we talk, what um, Chris touched on at the start was the camera is certified for Microsoft Teams rooms, um, but it's also certified for Microsoft Teams. So whether you're doing a room system or a BYO solution, um, it's, um, it's most certainly certified. Um, we've just released a, our partnership with HP, so HP Elite Slice, who offer a um, the MTR um, compute solution. By bundling that with the Panacast, you're able to do a, a complete Microsoft Teams room as a solution um, offered um, via Jamba and HP. Um, because we're, we're a camera, you can also pair it with some other solutions. So some other solutions we see popular on the market um, is the Lenovo Hub 500 for an MTR. Or if you are if you are more familiar with Crestron, you want to use one of their integrated kits and combine our camera and speaker um, with their devices as well. Um, oops, I think we've got the next slide coming up. Um, we've also got our BYOD solution as well. So if you've got a customer who's not quite ready to to jump into an MTR, but you want to give them that professional solution, we have the the BYOD or the Jabra Panacast Hub. So what it does is consolidates the uh, USB, HDMI, Ethernet. Um, and power all into to one cable. So when you roll into the room, you plug it into your laptop um, and you're able to um, connect straight off the, the Teams client that's natively on your PC as well. Um, and just the, just the key takeaways from our presentation, 100% um, room coverage, so you capture all the data as you can see the whole room. Um, as Chris touched on over, over here, the, the social distancing um, piece has been really powerful. The ability to um, light up those small and medium meeting rooms but keep a, a safe enough distance away from from your colleagues and by integrating your SDK, our SDK and API into your, your VC solution, um, you're able to um, capture a, a lot more um, data from what's happening in those rooms. And I'll hand that one back to you, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Uh, just wanted to touch back on quickly before I hand you back to Andrew uh, is the HP bundle. So that is a collaboration piece. That is not just us bolting on to an HP um, slice. This is a, 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 a partnership. Um, which works really well. Now it's also available uh, without the, the HP um, speaker. You can have the Jabra um, Speak 750, uh, which is team certified device as well. And so this is actually um, itemized down into a single SKU from our distributors and partners. So, you know, please feel free to reach out to your, to your local um, Jabra partner uh, to, to get more information on it. But also follow up with us, reach out to us on LinkedIn, or like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll share this content so that you can reach out to myself and Josh if you have any questions. Uh, it's a pretty exciting time um, with Panacast now that we have all these certifications and, and, and bundles available. So um, please, like I said, touch base with us and we'll be more than happy to assist you with demo equipment, et cetera. But with that, I think we've um, talked enough. I'll pass it over to you, Andrew. Thanks very much for, your, for allowing us to share. No problem. Thanks a lot, guys. Much appreciated. Um, I've actually never, I've seen the thing in person and held the thing, and it's quite impressive how small it is, um, but I've never actually seen sort of that many screenshots and demonstrations of how it actually works, so it's actually quite an impressive device that I think probably has a lot of use case, um, much more than I thought, so yeah, thanks for that. No, thank you, um, Yeah, no problem. Uh, did anyone have any questions? Jump in if they do, um, otherwise we've got uh, a knock from uh, Ribbon, can't get that right. Uh, are you there? If there's any questions, jump in as well. Yeah, um, yeah. So I won't be turning on my video because I'm running on a very bad internet connection. So hopefully you guys can hear me, and yep. I'll start yeah, sharing my yeah. screen soon. Let me know when you see my screen, guys. Yeah, no problem. There you are. Yep, you're away. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks everyone. No uh, problem. I know it's probably probably mine is the last presentation, and I usually, if, if it's the last presentation, yes, you're, you're sitting in between the the beer and you, beer or pizza. But we, I think, we can go ahead and have your pizza and beer virtually if you like. You can start. I don't, I don't, I don't mind if you're having your beer while you're listening to me. So some of don't you who don't, sorry. <laughs> I said, don't tempt me. <laughs> uh, I, I miss that. In fact, I miss uh, coming over and you know having that the chats. Uh, anyway, but one day, one day. All right. So 
I think most of you or some of you would know me. My name is Anup Soman. I'm, uh, I work for so former Sonus, now known as Ribbon, Ribbon Communications, based here in Sydney. And I have my colleague also who had joined on, in this meeting, Emmanuel Christophilis, also known as Manny. And uh, we look after ANZ region in terms of you know, supporting customers and partners for all our SBC and all the, all, all the solutions we have. So I have a couple of updates today in terms of the new products or new products we are bringing out to market. And one of them is, oops, new direct routing as a service offer. So basically it's known as the Ribbon Connect, which is which allows you to have, uh, set up your you know, uh, Teams DR direct routing to Teams in no time. So it's basically a hosted offering from Ribbon. So we host the services for you. It's a monthly service, you pay, you pay, you pay monthly. And it's like uh, hosted by us, managed by us, looked after by us, updated, patched, everything is done by Ribbon. And basically what it allows you to do is you can have Ribbon Connect and you allow you bring your own trunks, connect them to Ribbon Connect, and you can have them connected to Teams as well as if you have existing PABX. It's very simple to deploy. We have a GUI which you as a partner or if you are an end customer, you can manage your own uh, own team setup. I'll, I'll come to that slide in, in a minute, but it's all cloud-based, nothing on-prem, so you don't need any infrastructure anyway. You can just pretty, get, pretty much get started in a few minutes. So what you have is a, a common provisioning tool or a, or a GUI which we provide you where you could use that GUI to create users in Teams as well as you know get the SBC configured and hook it up to the SIP trunks. It's all through a single GUI, provisioning GUI option. You can connect to existing PABXs and those PABXs could be terminating the ISDN or SIP trunks and you could just work with the, the PABX so that calls can ring on the PABX as well as Teams. And it's a, it gives you basically a unified experience in terms of you know a caller could be from Teams or from the PABX, but you can still make calls and receive calls on both. And usually it becomes useful if you have existing PABXs which we, which customer can't get rid of or you know they are required uh, because they support contact center or similar applications. So this services will service will be available sometime end of this month, so end of September. But we are we are getting our trials ready. So if anyone is interested for a trial, please contact myself or uh, Manny. And it's, it would be a 30 days free trial for up to 25 users. And you can just pretty much get started straight away. So contact us if you are interested in, in your, if anyone is interested in the trials, please. The second update was about new release nine software that was uh, made available early this week, uh, last week, I should say. So there are new features which, are, which we have brought out in release nine, and some of them are related to like improved call services and you know deployment options we have brought out. Then uh, the, the features related to Teams resiliency and you know license rationalization in terms of some of the licenses will you don't pay for them anymore. We also have integration with what we call as Edge View, which is a, a which is a single service module which allows us to manage all the SBCs on different customer sites for partners. And I'll have it, I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slides. And we have also got OPEX licensing option now where you could, you know, uh, just pay per month on your usage. So talking about Edge View, so Edge View comes from a product family, which is Edge Mark devices, which was part of Edge Water. Edge Water was the organization Ribbon took over, or which acquired a couple of three years back. And those Edge Mark devices, which are today used for say analog ports, or they're SBC by itself, they're certified for 
Microsoft Teams as well. But the only thing they don't do is transcoding if you need that. But otherwise, those devices can be used for uh, you know Teams direct routing as well. They're certified for that. So th that 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 product portfolio used what we call as EdgeView centralized management platform, which allows you to manage provision or it talks to the devices and gets the information back from devices, which helps you troubleshoot and fix the issues. It it provides uh, the the devices talk to EdgeView management server and provide monitoring and alerts all the time. You can run reports and analyze call quality data and all that kind of good things are where possible on EdgeView. Now we have extended that on Edge Mark, on the Edge on the SBC Edge series. So you can now connect SBC 1000, 2000 and three lights to EdgeView, which is like a centralized management platform. You can have multiple, you know, containers if you want to call them. So each can each of those containers can a customer can have access to that. And you as a partner can manage all of those. So it would be centrally deployed and you can monitor and manage all your customer SBCs from one location. So just some of the sample views in terms of how it looks like. So the GUI allows the edge view GUI allows you to not only you know monitor, set up, and install latest software and patches. You can uh, you can schedule it, then you can uh, have use it for operational troubleshooting in terms of getting the alarms from the devices directly into edge view. Or if with three light, it allows you to do call quality monitoring. It keeps pulling information every fifteen minutes, and then it's it, it that. The type of uh, reports easily will help you identify where the issues or the call quality issues could be, you know, whether it's on a land side, van side, or if it's the device that is causing the problems. So all this is available as on uh, this week. As a really release nine on SBC three light is already available. It's GA already and uh, release sixteen point zero point one on on edge view would support that. SBC 1000, 2009.0 would be GA in a couple of weeks time. We have a new feature that was brought in to, basically it's the enhancement of the deployment wizard we have. So with, with the deployment wizard, I'm, I know most of you or some of you would have used it, where you run the wizard and you can set up, say teams to, uh, SIP carrier in probably less than five minutes. So for customers who have existing analog devices to be connected or existing PABXs. So once you have deployed that, and if you want to add an, another leg to the, the uh, existing configuration, we now have that option available where you can go and add a new peer and set the routing relationship between those the, the different entities. And it's basically, you know, you can, stitch all those calls together and uh, go from there. Three light, which was available in uh, in in the public cloud only in Azure till today. Uh, now we have support in AWS also. You can deploy it uh, three light in AWS. With uh, today as a first phase, you will get the AMI from Ribbon Portal. There is a form you can fill in, and then it will send you the details to get the AMI and phase two would be like where we would have it available in marketplace in AWS and there would be chime support as well going forward. So in terms of performance, you could see a small, a T3 small, a very small instance can support 100 sessions or 30 transcoded sessions. If you want to go up to a thousand pass through sessions, C5X large, which is still a small, Four vCPUs instance can support thousand sessions, and you could have up to four eighty of those calls as transcoded calls. We have also brought out enhancements in terms of Azure performance, so it's pretty much almost twenty percent in uh, you know better performance in terms of number of sessions we can support on DS one and DS three. So going from one hundred and twenty. 100 to 120 transcoded sessions from 400 to 500 transcoded sessions. 
But if you are not using any transcoding, there's still you can handle thousand sessions easily with four vCPUs. So a very small footprint in both public cloud, private cloud, as well as on-prem, and it can support huge number of calls. We have also introduced uh, a feature for call recording, which are uh, the so Light can now support SIPREC, would allow you to uh, integrate with the call recording solutions you might have. We have already tested this with NICE, so it works fine. So it's available on SIP, uh, on, on, on SBC Light, and you know it's just a license you need to purchase. That's it. And the new monthly recurring licensing option. So you could have your SBC either on prem if you want to deploy it on KVM, Hyper V, VMware, or you know it can be in Azure or AWS. And you can deploy a fully featured uh, all the licenses available Sweelight and we just bill you on a monthly basis and no upfront perpetual licenses uh, you have to purchase. So just uh, based on customer commitment, if there are, if they go over, say if you if your commitment is for 100 sessions and if you go over, we will just charge you for extra usage for that month. And there are a few resiliency features that I'm sure Andrew, you are waiting for. And this is like, internet destination route or a secondary route in case the primary route fails if you want to talk to teams. So this would be available in the next release or next maintenance release, I should say. And then there is, there would be, right now if you guys, if everyone, if you don't know, Microsoft is working on a solution similar to what we had with uh, Skype for Business SBA. So that SBA feature would be available on the on our SBC 1000, 2000, where we have ASM modules. So the, with ASM module, we would be able to run the SBA feature on that. And I think it's likely to be available sometime in Q4 or late Q4. So great, great features for in terms of resiliency and branch offices where you might. So today there could be a solution where if you have handsets being used by Teams user, those handsets, you could you have a solution, survivability solution or with the local SVCs, but your Teams client running on your PCs, there was no option for them to make any calls or you know they would just go dead. But uh, with this new SBA, that would uh, definitely, that issue would be resolved. And we are really, really looking forward to, you know, get that working. So there are some pilot, uh, pilot customers on it already, and uh, the test is going on at the moment. So both these features, resiliency features, are would be available in the next maintenance release, which would be sometime, uh, you know, in Q4 this year. And that's pretty much from me. Yeah. Any questions? Feel free. Thanks. I'm not appreciate that. If there any questions, just jump on in. Just generally speaking, if there's any questions across the board, uh, feel free to ask them because I think that brings us close to the end, does it? I think we've done quite well for time. Um, if I can find my agenda. My agenda. Yeah, no, that was it. That's correct. Hey, oh, there's Paul. Hello, hello. How's everyone? Good. I'll just just thumbs up. That's it. Raise your hand. All good. <laughs> hey, Andrew, I forgot in my session to mention Paul's awesome script. I call it Luigi. It's not Luigi. Luigi. <laughs> <laughs> but that I forgot to mention it. <laughs> and when I saw his photo, so that yeah, is yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Uh, you call it Luigi. That's funny. I don't think I'm going to have to be able to call it anything else going forward. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, so, so for those of you, since we've got a bit of time, this is Luigi. <laughs> I'm going to have to rename it now. <laughs> so this is it over here, and and uh, what it basically does is it allows you to co collect the line URI assignment data for Skype and Teams. Um, by default, it's collecting Teams. So when I go connect. It's going to come back and ask me some authentication questions. So uh, one moment while I collect those. 
Uh, all right, we'll put it our name and um, in case you didn't believe me, there it's popping up now. So this account doesn't actually have MFA, but because it's just uh, triggering the uh, A365 sign-in, if it's MFA, it'll just ring your phone or whatever, whatever you set up, right? Now, at the moment, the get data button is grayed out because it's busy loading all those PowerShell, all that fancy stuff that uh, Shane was showing us earlier, but from a Windows PC. Right, so it's loaded. If I go get data now, it goes and runs the script to populate. You'll see it's not too slow. Um, and if I have a look at this, this is all our users, all our phone numbers, uh, enterprise voice enabled. This I'm actually pulling from Active Directory, their mobile phone numbers, zip addresses, what policies they have, um, and it tells you what mode they're in. So you see we've got like mixed mode. This is actually live data. So it's got mixed mode. This is all Teams data, as you can see. So a whole bunch of people in here with Teams. It's sortable. So if I click on the button, It'll show me, okay, there's all the people with islands, there's people with some other setups and so on, right? If I also want the SFB data, well, I could have clicked that from the get go and just grab both in one go, but I'll just grab it now. Now, I don't need to log in for this because I actually have the PowerShell tools for Skype for Business on my local machine. And through the magic that is direct access, I'm able to connect there directly. So it'll jump in there. And of course, when the button pops back, that's when the data is there. So we'll just give it a moment as it's, there you go. Now, if you look under the user field, you'll actually see I've got dial-in conference, UM contacts, response groups, trusted applications. It's all there, everything. So, of course, these are all Skype for Business users, right? And again, um, I can sort by any of these columns. If we go sort by line URI, it's easy to pick a number that's free or not in use. There's a bogus number if I ever saw one. Look at that. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> right. Well, fortunately, that one's not enterprise enabled, enterprise voice enabled. So that's all good. But you get the idea, right? And down here, if we want to search for anything, I can go look at, let's go find Andrew. And you can type any of the data that's across any of these fields. You can just go and type and hit the search. Um, oh, well, in theory. Why is my, ah, my search isn't working. Damn it. Okay. Update coming out soon. <laughs> When did I break that? Yeah, okay. Nothing to see here. Search works fine. You'll see in the next <laughs> download. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, that's that's Luigi in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, awesome. S serious question. What What is the real name? It's uh, it's actually the acronym is line and URI assignment. So Luria. <laughs> but I do like this better. <laughs> I absolutely agree. I'm going to make that stick. Watch. Watch this space. <laughs> yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Hey, so um, as we get to the tail end, any questions before I, because uh, I do have one more matter to sort out. No questions? I'm looking for raised hands. I'm not seeing anything. I just want to say that that application is available on GitHub if you are interested. Oh, that's true. Yes, Luigi. Yeah, Luigi's on GitHub. <laughs> Um, just look for me on, on uh, LinkedIn or on Twitter and uh, you'll find I made some noise about it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's been around for a long time. I've been using it back in the days and Link already. I just haven't made much noise about it. Cool. So um, no questions. So one of the things I wanted to just ask or put out there is if you have something you'd like to discuss, um, I certainly would see a, like to see a lot more of Mr. Hoey's uh, really amazing automation skills. I've seen some of the outcome of that, but man, I think I could take some lessons there. That'd be awesome. <laughs> we shall see. Hey, Josh, I'm, I'm, I'm well. available for hire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you are. <laughs> so there's there's one other thing. The um, if, if you do have anything you would like to see, or if you're keen to give it a go to to present on one of these sessions, just hit us up. You can you can either chat to me on LinkedIn or Twitter, or you know uh, even through the meetup. We're not uh, difficult either way. Perhaps next time we can have a bit more in person and have those beers on. It was promising. That'd be great, eh? We'd also love to hear customer stories. Even you know, it doesn't have to be technical. Just any successes that you've had or failures. <laughs> That's a very good point. You know, I don't know if you guys remember, but some time ago we had a customer from Kutai Logistics and they had a they did a session on how they did their um, 
teams deployment, what challenges they had and so on. And it was the, the, the I think it was their IT manager plus their lead engineer who came in for an interview. And that was just like so well received. Um, you know, even weeks later, I was still getting people pinging me about it. So, you know, if you've got a good story, um, you know, that would be great to hear, especially if you're sitting quietly in the back there going, oh, yeah, well, our deployment didn't go too bad. You know, we've got some stuff to share. We'd like to uh, to talk about. That would be very much appreciated. Now, there is one other matter. As soon as I can find the right page, give me a moment. I'll find it in a, in a moment. Is there anything else from your end, Andrew? Uh, no, nothing from my end except to say thank you for everyone for coming along. Appreciate it. So there is there is one thing we've got a giveaway, a really really nice giveaway today, thanks to uh, the the very fine folks at uh, Jabra. And if I can just get my there we go. This is more like it. So if I could just get my little, I'm doing now. In the past, I used to go so far as to to ask some questions and see who gets up first and so on, but that doesn't always work with the shyer ones amongst us, right? Look at so, that, eh? Look at this. So first things first. I grab this list thanks to Teams, so the new feature where you can grab the attendees. Now I grab this about you know midway through our session, so. There are some latecomers who've been naughty and missed out on all the good stuff and then just want to grab a reward. So you may not be on there or you've come in and you haven't put your proper name in. If that's the case, you were just user one or something like that. I didn't include you. Sadly, if you were a presenter, I've pulled your name out. Now, they may still. And there's also a couple of Jabra users there too. Yeah, Paul, yeah, yeah. So they don't that get was it my next comment. <laughs> so uh, just call them out and I'll pull them out. You got Bridget. Bridget. Yep. Renato. Renato. Uh, which one's that? Uh, Renato, is he on there? Yep. I'm on there. Yeah. 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 Luigi. Um, <laughs> Brent Mitchell. Brent, I thought that name looked familiar. Yeah, you know that so, name. Who doesn't? Um, yes. That's it, I think. Rachel, I think. It? Rachel as well. Rachel. Yeah, take, take Rachel out. Rachel, this one over here. There we go. Right. Mr. Yeah, Braun. Feel free is, to spin away now. Is Mr. Braun still here? Peter? No, he's gone. So, he, um, um, yeah, well, that's the way it goes. Eh? If your name's not in there, now's a good time to raise your hand before I spin the wheel. Looking for raised hands. No. Okay. First thing I'm going to do is just shuffle these around a bit. Right. Ready? Let's do it. <laughs> oh, well, that's great. Yeah, that's yeah, brutal. So close, eh? <laughs> that's all. So let's just ask Brilliant. you, is Damon, you still here, Mr. Ellis? I don't is, think he is. No. Okay, well, he has the problem, right? If Mr. Give Ellis is young. no longer here, he's gone. So let's go with another one, eh? We'll shuffle names again for good measure. And if, this is way more fun than asking a question, isn't it? <laughs> I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm liking it. Oh, <laughs> right. No way. Let's see if you can get my name right. <laughs> well, that's You're what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go hilarious. with the menu. Do we win a prize if we get it right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, it's a long Greek name. Uh, let's just go with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, Manuel, do you know what you've won? Uh, the Jabra, that new Jabra camera, I'm assuming, I'm hoping. <laughs> Josh, the full of these Ah, uh, awkward, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, I can post this. Good try, though. Today. Um, Chris, do you uh, want drinks, to jigs, drinks with Jabra down at, uh, down at the Viaduct. There you go. <laughs> Next no, time I'm, I'm allowed into the I country. Wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put you through that. Don't worry about that. <laughs> um, do you want me to announce yes, it, Paul? Please. What, what yes, you've won? Please. Yeah, you've yes. won a pair of um, Jabra uh, Evolve 65Ts, the earbuds for enterprise oh, grade. Yeah, earbuds. They're pretty cool. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Awesome. No problem. I'll organise the time to. I'll, get, I'll give them to Paul, or either way, we'll figure it out how to get them to you. Yeah. What, what you can do is um, you can. Well, you can I, 
Yeah, yeah send it to him. Yep. You can definitely look after him. <laughs> so, so if you can send them to to me, and I'll get the office to to get them back to Manuel. Manuel, if you could just connect with me and send me your address. Yeah, no worries. Where, where are you based, by the way? Melbourne. Melbourne. <laughs> look at that, and and I'll get them sent off to you. Eh? Well, yeah. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, guys. No problems. Nice. Hey, thanks everyone for joining. With uh, it's been a blast. I'm sorry I missed the beginning, but apparently customer is king, so I had to sort something out. And thanks Andrew for taking the lead on that uh, in, <laughs> in short notice. No problem at all. Cool. Thanks everybody. See you at the next one. Yeah. Thanks guys. Great session. Thanks everyone. Yeah, sure. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thanks guys. Bye.